Well, welcome. This is a, a, a Dash crypto panel. Um, we're going to talk about what's going on in Dash. My name is Chuck Williams. For those of you who don't know, I'm a UI UX tech lead at Dash. Hey, I'm Joel Valenzuela. I work for Dash Force. Hi, I'm Amanda B. Johnson, and I really like Dash a lot. <laughs> so do I. So um, we are a bit understaffed at this moment. Uh, so we're going to put together just uh, a few items that we're going to talk about. Um, so first off, I'm going to talk about what's going on here from my perspective at Dash, some of the most exciting things that I think are happening. And uh, I'll pass it off, and, and um, you guys can go from there, and we'll go around, I think. Um, May I make a suggestion, Chuck? Sure. I was just wondering, um, before you tell us about what's going on at Dash, in case there's anybody here who doesn't actually know what Dash is or how it's different from anything else, would it be all right if we uh, did a little primer first? Sure. Yeah. Okay, Maybe great. Maybe you want to start with that and I'll follow up. Okay, that sounds great. I'd be happy to. Uh, so, hello, uh, everyone. And um, I would like to go over basically um, what it is that I think sets Dash apart. And there are two categories of that, I think. One is if you're an end user. And one is if you are interested in, I guess, what I would call the back end of crypto. Um, and so I'll start with the back end of crypto because the end user stuff is totally impossible uh, without it. So uh, Dash is different from the vast majority of, the majority of its competitors on the back end. Hi, welcome. Um, in two, well, actually one primary way, and hi, welcome, uh, and I'm going to call that uh, the key differentiator I would call governance. And governance is, I think, probably the most boring thing in crypto, maybe the most boring thing in the world, um, and yet it is uh, the most important, uh, the most key. And the way that Dash is governed is by those who have the most stake in it. Uh, or as I like to say, the people have the most to gain as well as the most to lose. And um, it also happens to be those people who run a great majority of our infrastructure. So you may have heard that in a lot of other cryptocurrencies, they rely a great deal on volunteers to run their infrastructure, um, which bumps them up into problems of scalability in that they worry that if they grow larger than they are uh, by a lot, that some of their volunteers will begin to drop off the network, which is a very real concern. Uh, and so that is how Dash is primarily different on the back end in that um, these governors, these people running the infrastructure are also able to vote. That's how decisions are made. And then as far as front end, uh, user facing stuff, uh, Dash has two key features which we think will make it the digital cache of the future, essentially. Um, one of those is the ability to have privacy uh, if you want it. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, the basics of how cryptocurrency works, like, like in the first cryptocurrency, the pilot cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, is that uh, we can all have a certainty of the coin count because every time a new coin is created, it's announced. And every time that coin moves, it is announced. And that is so good for auditability and traceability, um, but it is so bad for privacy. And so what Dash does is it takes that very same model of keeping everything auditable and traceable, but adds a little twist in that if you send a request out to the network, your wallet will take your funds and begin to mix the history of your funds with the history of the funds of other users on the network. And so that leaves the auditability trail perfectly open while also making it so that you don't have to reveal uh, your holdings and source of funds if you don't want to. And then the second uh, user-facing feature is what we call instant send. And it's basically like, I, I think it's like the juggernaut in cryptocurrency right now. Hardly anyone knows that Dash has solved the problem of waiting for confirmations. Uh, if you've ever used cryptocurrency like to deposit on an exchange or use like an ATM or whatever, you might have experienced the whole like wait for two confirmations or wait for three confirmations. And that problem has been solved by Dash for three years now. Uh, and basically using that same, uh, the, the, the nodes, the master nodes, the, the governors that I was talking about before, uh, we are able to offer the equivalent of an instant confirmation making double spends more or less technically impossible from the merchant uh, standpoint. 
And uh, so these are the key features that we are moving forward with. Um, and Chuck and Joel will tell you more, I'm sure, about why we at Dash are quite certain that even though we've solved all these problems, this is still not crypto your mother can use. Forget about it. Um, that's going to take a lot more work on our part and is something that we actually plan to roll out in version one this year. Right. So there we have like the basics of what makes Dash different, et cetera. And now that little foreshadowing about uh, crypto your grandma can use. Uh, I have, yeah, there is a little bit to be desired with the crypto space in general. We talk about this is the money of the future. This is going to change. It's going to end the Fed, man. It's going to do all this kind of stuff. And we're not, we're getting very close, but we're not quite there yet. So I don't have a bank account and haven't for a few years. I make an, all my income in Dash, and that's all I have to spend. And so obviously, when I come into the dark zones, like out here, I have to stock up on a little bit of fiat to live. But where I live in New Hampshire, I basically pay for everything in Dash. And there are a few little, uh, a few little. It's definitely something that, for example, San Diego is a pretty big city. No place took Dash here until um, Danny from the Crypto Show just rolled into town a few days ago and got a print shop to, to take in town. But if you think about Bitcoin, this or and all the cryptocurrency by default has been around since for nine years now. That's a long time, especially in technology. Yet. Go down the street anywhere. Try to spend it. Who's going to take it? If this is the fantastical, wonderful, perfect money of the future, what's taking so long? It's not government regulators, as much as we love to blame them for everything, haven't done too much to stop this wonderful innovation yet. So what is the holdup? And I would say the holdup is what Chuck's going to talk about. So I'll just uh, segue into that um, briefly. I know that... Um, so the holdup is, you know, we live in a society where people are used to working with businesses. P businesses are still trying to do business on a handshake and trying to, you know, do backroom deals, you know, to, to get to get things done. Um, they want a throat to choke. They want somebody who's accountable. They want to know who they can point at. And this is one of the big problems, I think, with, um, you know, businesses and uh large ent entities, organizations, governments accepting cryptocurrency. They don't know who to blame if something goes wrong, so they, so they walk away from it. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that, honestly, being a, you know, two and a half decade corporate developer, I think that's one of the things that attracted me to the Dash Core Group Incorporated was there was an entity, there was a throat to choke, there were accountable people who were going to take responsibility for making deals and getting things done. And that's what's happening. You know, we've, we've got Ryan Taylor, the CEO, who's, who's um, been advocating for a long time. He comes from hedge fund management. And, um, you know, he, he's, he's a traditional kind of, you know, business hedge fund guy, you know, and he, and he looks at accounting mechanisms and practices and has been managing that and being very transparent with all of that for, for a number of years now. Um, to me, transparency is a big thing. There was a point in my career where I said, I won't work for an organization that is hiding their books. And um, I started working for smaller companies, and I, I and I came to appreciate and advocate for you know having an open book policy where all the expenses and things were gone through on a regular basis, so that we could see the status of the organization. Um, PlayerLink, my pr previous employer, did that on a quarterly basis, and and um, there were a number of other org organizations that I worked at that did that, but none of the big ones like Level Three, they don't do that, um, you know that sort of thing. So having that level of transparency for the internal team and uh, the external team, actually. They're, the quarterly reports are, are published on YouTube, you know, and there's data breaking down by department, the expenditures, the holdings, all that kind of stuff. Our run rate is um, posted monthly on our master node proposal system and voted on, um, and the core team salaries are broken down by department. So everything is kind of open um, to the degree that we can that we can be, you know, without risking the individual safety of, you know, the taboo of who makes what, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's really valuable. And having that, that, that entity means that we can go and talk to people. You know, we can go make deals. We can uh, integrate our work with this old school traditional system of, you know, legal businesses and legal rules and contracts and things like that. And 
that's one of the things I think really sets us apart. We have, I think, the first internationally recognized DAO that exists, um, decentralized autonomous organization, being a New Zealand trust that is beneficiaried by the Association of Masternode Network, um, a an anonymous group of individuals, and that is administered by a Swiss administrator who is bound by law to act on behalf of the beneficiaries, the Masternode Network, with regard to the trust's assets. Those assets, question mark, are Dash Core Group Incorporated, a Delaware corporation, my employer, and all intellectual property thereby released which is intended to be released MIT open source, which for me as a developer is extremely attractive because when you're a developer, you wanna get your work out there. I have, I have my name on a couple of patents and one patent pending, I don't even know where that's at. I've made millions for other corporations for most of my career. Nobody knows that what I've done. I have to tell people, look, I, you know, if you upload a document to FedEx, that was my work. You know, If you've ever bought a Shutterfly photo book application, that was my work. Um, nobody knows that. I don't get any prestige for that. Uh, I wish I did. You know, it's kind of my life's work and nobody knows that I did. So, so for developers, getting their work out there, like Codeblock recently uh, posted uh, about our latest series of dips, um, Dash Improvement Proposals. I know that he's very happy to be engaging with the community in a way that shows, hey, this is what I've done, this is my work, um, and, and people are going to get get recognition for that. Recognition is very big uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing work, you know? You wanna be recognized for, your, for the work that you do. So that's, all of that kind of comes together in a way where we as an organization are approachable by businesses, governments, and so on, and I know that that's happening. For instance, I can't give specific details, but I do know that Ryan very recently, within the past three weeks, sat down with a payment organization that is considering taking Dash, and they cover half a million retail outlets in the United States alone. And so that means that you're gonna have huge washes of Dash accepting companies, boom, just like that. And that's gonna be happening within the next year, year and a half. These corporations move slow. So, um, but Bitcoin, who do they talk to? If you're Home Depot, who do you talk to? If you're the payment processor for Home Depot, Target, and all these other organizations, who do you talk to if you want to accept Bitcoin? And you want, and if anything goes wrong, how do you deal with it? Well. Those guys have no option but to hire some kind of Bitcoin developer, and those guys are, oh my God, they're really hard to find, right? I mean, anybody who's the blockchain developer is in high demand. I, a last statistic I heard is every, for every one of those guys, there are 16 jobs available. And um, I know that working at Dash is, um, it, it, it's, it's a, you don't work at Dash because you want to get paid, you know, as a, as a developer or anybody. You, you work at Dash because you believe in the vision. You believe in the ethos of what's happening. And um, so, that's, so that's a big thing. But the, I want to come back around and kind of close this section off and, and, and hand off the microphone a little bit. But uh, the, the, what attracted me to Dash are those things plus that, that aspect of privacy and the, really the, go the governance. And for me, the most interesting thing about working at Dash is every month watching that core team proposal, making sure that you know, there's a certain percentage of, of uh, voters that, are, uh, that think that we're doing a good enough job to get paid. Um, and if we're not, you know, watching the comments, reading the feedback, um, also watching the forums, seeing who's complaining about what. Some masternodes are not, are consistently unhappy with the work that we do, some master note, and, and I think that the, the happy majority, or yeah, the happy majority, they don't, they don't say much, you know, it's the squeaky wheels that, that get oiled. So we try to accommodate, I think we've made a lot of changes. It has affected our internal working process, in terms, especially in terms of communications this year. Um, you know, we're doing, uh, I think it's bi-weekly outputs of our monthly management meetings. Um, and there's, um, there's a lot more communicated. We have at least 12 core team members that are committed to blogging on a fairly regular basis. So there's a lot more internal information coming out. Um, but uh, yeah, so, th so it's, it's that, and um, the, the governance system is, is really the major piece that, that attracted me in that way, because you know, <laughs> working for random people, just like Ben Swan says, it's like, you know, I don't know who's, who's paying my salary, but um, I certainly get enough feedback to, to know whether or not I'm doing a decent job. So um, as a developer, that's, those are the, some of the things that really attracted to me. Also, Dash is the only one that I was able to find that was really interested in serving the end users, that was really interested in making it usable for, for people. But the fact of the matter is, 
if you if you look around, I've been I've been um, you know studying and working in the field of UX since about 2004. Um, I didn't know that it was UX prior to that, so I didn't really start labeling it u user experience design or development until that time. But I I was I've always been you know engaged in interaction design and interface development. One of the things that I've concluded is is any organization that focuses on the end user's experience and just making them smile at some point in that process in an un unexpected way, you win. You win against any other business that's just satisfactory, that's just doing the job, that's a mandatory thing that they have to do, that they have to go through. Imagine if you had a DMV that would serve you coffee and you know, uh, you know, have, have amenities for you while you waited in the, in the lobby. What if you didn't even have to wait? My wife and I flew here into town from Colorado Springs. We went through security. Um, what else did we do? There was a number of steps along the way. We, we rented a car. We didn't have to wait at any step along the way. And it was a crazy experience because Colorado Springs is not a lot of traffic. That's the kind of experience that we want to bring at Dash. That's the, that's the, everybody on the core team agrees. We need to make this easier. We need to make this better. We're not necessarily technologists reaching for technology solutions that may or may not be pragmatic or valuable. We're trying to deliver things that people will use, will accept, both on the merchant front for businesses, systems, and integrations so that they can use it for accounting practices and all the things that they need to do to just run their business, and for the individuals to make it easy so that peer-to-peer -peer exchanges are simple, you know? And that's why we're bringing usernames. But before I go into the evolution platform, um, maybe I want to share some thoughts. Yeah. I'm going to sort of expand a little bit on that whole governance idea thing. So for those familiar with cryptocurrency, it's as a completely distributed platform that you kind of run, it's, it's the, you can't whack the head off at the snake, right? It's just anyone who runs the client runs the network and then you can't just stomp out every single node all over the world. It's censorship resistant peer-to-peer -peer digital currency. That's why coins like Bitcoin got so much of the world's imagination because this is something completely new, completely not vulnerable to the old kind of ways. Now, of course, there are some challenges with that, and as someone who, like, well, I used to live entirely off of Bitcoin before I did with Dash, and it worked for a little while, and then stuff started to go weird, like, oh, why is this, why do I have to pay $3 for a fee? What happened to the, the confirmation times? Like, why, how come it's not, it didn't go through in a week, and people, like, ask me questions. I have questions. Who do I go to? Well, no one, because it's just kind of out there, it just kind of people are running in this stuff and then the developers didn't put out this and then the miners, who knows if they agree or not, but they didn't, they didn't split the coin into, they didn't, you know, so there's just so much like, who knows, there's so much uncertainty and you can't really run a powerhouse of a global economy on that kind of wishy-washy uncertainty and it really got to the point where it's hard, like this is, it's almost like the tragedy of the commons situation. No one owns it. No one owns parts of it. No one has ownership responsibility stake in it. Just kind of a natural resource out there, which is beautiful and free until someone comes in and takes it over because there's no, no stewardship of it. And so where payment companies really have the advantage is they have resources, they have staff, they have an idea of the end user that they can come together as a unit and say, the board comes together and say, well, this is what we're gonna do, and then they have a CEO that goes and does stuff, and they can make deals with big companies and say, oh, well, let's integrate into your payment solution, and we're gonna do this. And they can incentivize people, say, hey, you get five bucks to start up your PayPal account, free money, here you go. They can do all that, but then at the same time, they're, you know, they're centralized evil behemoths that can be used to censor you and your freedom, and so, Unfortunately, in the early, you know, stage one cryptocurrency, we are stuck in this kind of no man's land between too unowned, just too, too undefined, and too defined. And the thing that makes Dash different is it has a function to take this completely decentralized, completely free system and give it the advantages, make it, give it a mechanism by which you can give it the advantages of like a large payment company, for example. So the way the Dash governance system works is 
10% of the total coins created every month are available to fund projects such as development. And the master nodes, who are incentivized stakeholders, <coughs> vote on what happens to that. And that's it. They vote. If it, the net 10% of the vote happens to a proposal, then it gets funded. It comes straight out of the block. It gets created from nothing and goes into Chuck's pocket. Just kidding. Not, <laughs> not specifically, not that directly, but it's so loose and free as well in that you could say you have to put a five dash spam filter fee to say to request funds and then if you get a 10% net then you pass and it gets paid and no one can stop you and the content of that proposal can be anything you could just say oh, lovely day out there or fire chuck well, hold on we'll, we'll get to that in a second you could say lovely day out there pay me hundred thousand dollars or you know, equivalent of Dash. And if enough, enough people like that, you get it to say there's a lovely day. There's nothing preventing that. Of course, because it's a human system, most people will not vote for something that ridiculous. Now, that's how the core, so when the Dash core team was figuring out, just like the Bitcoin core team, just like all these other teams, how are we gonna fund this? How are we gonna pay for the people who make the code? Because miners get paid. And people who run the network, but not people who make the network don't not protocol level. So how do we pay this? It's like, well, that, the Dash Foundation didn't really pan out that well. And so we're saying, well, let's, let's create a self-funding mechanism. And of course, there's always the opportunity of, oh, let's just take 10% of all the coins created and give it to, straight to the developers. But no, instead of that, let's have 10% and make developers work for it. And the core team, Dash core team, month after month, has to go ask for the permission to, from the rest of the network, from the people who own and are incentivized in the network, who could be anyone. Anyone with a thousand dash can run a master node. Any thousand people with one dash can pull it together and run a master node. You can't stop that. You can't decide who it is. You can't stop people from owning or participating in the system. And they all have, when Chuck wants to be paid, he puts a pro, well, not him, but the CFO of the dash core team puts in a budget proposal and says, hey, we want to pay our guys. And then that has to get funded. And if they're not doing a good enough job, like they're not increasing the block size in order to allow the network to scale, if they're not solving a big problem, if the network is unhappy, they don't get money. That simple. And that's where it kind of, about a year, year and a half ago, that's where we kind of got into a, a, a bizarre territory uh, because for the most part, it was the Dash Core team that was m making almost all the proposals. and getting funded, getting the majority of the funding, and there was a few small other projects that got funded and stuff. And Amanda, for example, was making some videos to educate uh, the world about the benefits of Dash. And I, I think, were you the first non-core contractor? I've been told that. Yeah, yes. I think so. so. Yeah. She made this revolutionary idea, just like, I'm gonna ask for a job from just, just the network, not from the core team. And then a little over a year ago, uh, Myself and a couple friends started this thing called Dash Force, which was going to be another organization that would help with news and promotion and things like that for the Dash network. And so we put in a proposal and have been passed ever since. And it's not the core team. We did not ask for permission from the core team. We just went straight to the network. And now I work for Dash, he works for Dash, but different parts of Dash that don't necessarily have to work together, even though here we are right now working together. So, for example, we're the ones who organized the, and asked for the funding for, you know, I put in the proposal to fund Libertopia's sponsorship. Why we're here. It was not the core team, it was another arm of Dash that comes out and does this. And of course, since we're in good relations with the core team, we said, hey, Chuck, do you want to come and talk? I know you're way smarter than me. And he's like, sure. And so, there is a, there are several teams like this working for Dash right now in Venezuela as well. They just said, well, we have a currency problem. We have a big problem over here. We want to promote Dash everywhere. So uh, a friend of mine, Eugenia, she put in a proposal saying, I want to run a series of Dash conferences in Venezuela. And I want to educate people about this. And so she did, and she got funded. She worked for Dash as much as me. Never met her before, never met any of us, probably. And now she will start running these conferences that have taste, that had several thousand people come to in Venezuela. and. Uh, one of her associates said, I, I want to start a merchant adoption. And so he put in a proposal as well. And now there's over 120 Dash accepting businesses in Venezuela that are, from what they tell me, are soon to be two, 3,000 within the next couple months. 
And this was, you know, 60 in Caracas alone, right? And so this is like, with a grassroots cryptocurrency movement like that, like in good old jolly old days of Bitcoin, you're like, oh, well, let's all get together and do a crowdfund and try to start a thing there and stuff like that. And that's, that's how a lot of amazing things have gotten accomplished. And that's really great. But now you have this ability to do have that same decentralized fire, the same like grassroots energy, but the power of a large corporation behind you by just asking to participate in the decentralized autonomous organization that is Dash. And I believe right now the Dash monthly payout is worth about around close to three million US dollars per month. So imagine what you could do for cryptocurrency adoption if you can spend three million every month and it's not going into one large wasteful corporation where you just, you have, that's like a big censorship problem right there, which is just the network itself can fund and run its own things. And so that's where you start to have an area where you have all these problems that cryptocurrency could solve. Oh, it's better than banks because of this. It's the own. It's radically transparent. It's resistant to censorship. It's all this kind of stuff. And then the merchant just doesn't care because it doesn't integrate into their app. And then you have to wait for someone to do that and wire the fees this way. Or how come every single time I broadcast a transaction here, it goes through, you know, whether or not it gets confirmation right away, it goes through eventually. But because the, the merchant nodes aren't set up the right in this, like I know a friend of mine got a hotel in Accra, Ghana to take Dash and they just have a big old printed QR code there. And it's like, well, what happens if they didn't set up their merchant solution to recognize zero confirmation transactions and make sure there's no double spends in them? No. How about Dash can have instant send and lock in those inputs and make sure it's going to be done across the board. But more importantly, where does this decision to, when you say, hey, we should do this for customer, for the end user, you can come together as one, as a network with consensus and you can, anyone can just put in five Dash, put in a proposal that just asks for five Dash back and just has a question. 2000, January 2016, Evan Duffield, Dash's founder, put in a proposal saying, there's a block size debate in Bitcoin right now. Should we, when the time comes, increase our block size from one megabyte to two megabyte and beyond? And the network voted yes, civil war averted. Just over. It's settled, the network has spoken. When you get to the Nakamoto consensus where you have you know, miners running different versions of the software, that works as like a last ditch effort kind of thing where it becomes irreconcilable differences. You got one vision of Bitcoin, another vision of Bitcoin, and they have to go their separate ways. But you can't decide things before then without an actual governance system. You can't say, we think we should adopt this strategy. We think we should adopt this logo. Now, um, you, you guys have seen this logo on the lanyard, right? Um, it's a refresh from the old logo, and Pete's wearing like a thing of the old logo, we, we all are. The decision was to make, to come up with a new, like a, a refresh, a more public, um, public facing logo. A few people decided that would be a good idea. So the Dash Core team decided to work with a company called Ogilvy & Mather to do a, a big marketing firm, do like a rebrand. And they came up with one version of logo and then someone else in the community said, no, 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 there's this New York City branding firm, Tharp & Clark, that they, they, they're more branding experts. They have a better idea of a logo. and they just put it to the network for a vote. And as it turns out, the not core team selected option won out. And it's like, can you imagine in a giant corporation, you put out like a new logo refresh. How many companies just come out with a new logo refresh or whatever? And how many times is it a terrible idea? Sometimes they, sometimes they come out with a terrible version of it and they have to wait until people ridicule them on social media all and just stop buying their product. They have to wait until they spend millions in testing to figure out that doesn't work. Instead, they're like, hey, we're gonna do a logo and then the network says, no, you're not, you're doing this one. All right, I guess we're doing this one. And it, it was, it's pretty funny because some of the demo videos of Dash Evolution, the next, uh, the next level of Dash, which I'm sure Chuck, Chuck's gonna talk our ears off about, some of them have what was thought was going to be the new logo, some of the old vestiges and it's like, oh, well, I guess, we aren't a centralized corporation. We can't decide for ourselves the direction of this. The network has spoken, so 
Yeah, the video number three is going to have <laughs> this one on it, probably. <laughs> and it's like, it's a little bit of a mess for some people who are used to just a clean, sterile corporate environment where everything, they know who the boss is. But there's 4,700 bosses in Dash about right now. And they, they can speak very clearly, even though it might not be, you might not know where they are in the world, what they're doing. And just having that, that structure with maximum, maximum decentralization and maximum power and efficiency all in the same thing is something that the world, I think it's as world changing or more world changing than the development of the blockchain itself. It's like a, this, this is what keeps me up. This is why I don't get sleep. I stay up and thinking about oh, oh, what can we do with the DAO? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so then I will just set things up for Chuck to then explain um, Dash Evolution to us then. Uh, so Dash Evolution, and when I say evolution, uh, that's really like just a code name for the forthcoming makeover of Dash. Uh, the makeover of how Dash's blockchain works in many ways. And that started in sometime definitely before December of 2015. Uh, and the founder of Dash, Evan Duffield, a uh, chap from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, he had the great foresight to sit down with his mother uh, with a Dash Core wallet and was like, you know, dear mother, please, uh, why don't you use this software and tell me what you think about it? And like, I just wish that there had been a camera there because I just would have loved to have seen, you know, what I know must have been like a silent scream from inside, um, because using cryptocurrency is just shit, uh, especially something like a full node core wallet. I mean, key management, please. And um, so he had, you know, the great foresight to realize, like, okay, you know, if my dear sweet mother here is not interested in using, uh, you know, my creation as it exists. Uh, we're, I think we're going to have a little problem when it comes to uh, selling this as, oh, the future of money, you think? And um, so the, the specifications were then laid out for how can something which is a blockchain-based, decentralized, cryptographically secured network on the back end, how can that look like a PayPal or a Venmo on the front end without requiring intermediary companies to serve up that software for, for customers to have to be completely reliant upon. How, how is that even possible? And it turns out it is possible. Not that I know how, but it turns out that it is. And uh, this, this, I think, is going to, I mean, it's really the only shot we have at mass adoption, I think, because much as you hear, um, much as you hear about cryptocurrency on the news and much as you're, you know, you have friends who say they own it or this or that or this or that, your friends who say they own it, uh, I would invite you to determine how many of them have actually ever possessed it. Something I've learned is that a lot of people who say they own cryptocurrency and they may own, you know, quite significant amounts of it, it's never left their Coinbase account. They've never used a wallet in their life. Yeah, so I mean, we're talking people who are investors, early adopters, have never used a wallet. They wouldn't know how to manage their private keys. This is like super serious because what we have out there right now is a world of crypto banks. It's just crypto banks is, is mostly what it is. Um, and that is like not at all, you know, the full potential of what Satoshi designed. Uh, and so I, I really think that what is coming out of Dash this year, um, it's just set for second half 2018. So I suppose it could be as soon as July. And, and I'm giving them, I will give, the, I will give you core team until dis midnight on December 31st of this year to roll out evolution. And um, that I think, and, and Chuck will tell you more about the components, but if I may give you just a brief breezy overview, uh, we're talking a replacement of the cryptographic address with human readable and reusable usernames. Um, we are talking about replacement of the device specific wallet problem. That is, my coins can either live on my phone or my coins can live on my laptop, not both. Uh, we're talking about replacing that problem with what is effectively 
uh, uh, login credentials, your Dash username along with your Dash passphrase log you into your Dash account from any device. Um, and it is also going to be the release of a little, what's being called a decentralized API, which is a little, a little snippet of code that any merchant can plug onto their checkout page and hey, guess what, now they accept Dash. So that means that they don't need to do like in-house special development of making like a merchant solution um, if, if they don't have special business requirements that would demand that. And that also means that they don't need to sign up with a corporation like a BitPay or a Coinbase or whatever to do their invoicing for them and of course charge to do that. And so that is that. Is that. So I'll share a couple of pieces that I think um, are very interesting um, to those who haven't had my experience. Um, when I first came onto Dash and we were going this direction of evolution, you know, it was still actually a bit ambiguous even to both Evan and Andy, our chief architect, um, how we were going to do what we needed to do in order to deliver this, this experience that we were all envisioning in some you know, various ways. And uh, a little known fact is that every developer, every blockchain developer on the Dash core team who was originally presented with this new username idea balked. Like, we hated the idea. This was, we, were, we didn't understand it. We're like, why, how are you, why? So the proposal, very simply, the most resistance that was received was we need to get usernames on the blockchain. And we were all like, what? Are you, are you crazy? You're gonna put? The, this, how, how are we going to keep it private? How are we going to know, like, you, every, you're going to know who's getting paid what? Everybody's going to know, like, there was so much resistance. And, and Evan and Andy, um, you know, they, they, <laughs> they spent weeks meeting together, sketching out stuff, sharing videos internally. Look, mate, this is how we're going to do, this is, we're going to separate it here and we're going to, and, and, and uh, I had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong and, and, and talk with Evan um, around that time. And we brought the development, the core team develop, uh, team together at the, I think just after the apex of this resistance when finally people were starting to come around and say, okay, okay, okay. They, so we had to solve the privacy thing in addition to the username thing. We had to solve all of these various issues from a design perspective and what honestly what saved us was this second tier layer of the masternode network without the masternode network we could not be doing what we're doing but the masternode network enables us to have a an, a, a decentralized anonymous third party witness to every broadcast that happens on the network so you get for free you get a number of things when you when you implement a solution uh, that to, to broadcast and receive transmissions from client to client, peer to peer, through this masternode network with a second tier of mining validators, right? You get a lot of things for free. You get end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, as a for instance. And that's a very powerful thing. If you get end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, that means I can encrypt a message with my private key after making an exchange with somebody else who has shared their public key, I can use their public key and my private key, encrypt a message, send it off, they are the only ones who are able to decrypt that message. And that doesn't need to land on the blockchain. And you can only do that with a third party signature from the masternode network. And that's a sub-selection, a randomly selected sub-selection of young nodes, middle nodes, and old nodes. So, that's, so, it's, so nobody can come in with a billion dollars and just buy a bunch of masternodes and start manipulating the network. And so there's a lot of different security mechanisms that continue to be maintained and strengthened through the use of this Masternode network while still implementing this very simple thing we call usernames. And now you're going to be able to pay people with usernames and nobody's going to know how much you're receiving, but you'll still be able to get paid unless you get paid to your public tipping address. But that, you don't have to use that. You'll still be able to get paid by names using contact sharing information or not. It's up to you. And so we have this very basic principle, this philosophy of, look, you got to maintain that privacy. We got to make sure it's fast for retail. And 
uh, it's got to be easy. It's got to be super easy to use. So those 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 working principles are not easy to solve when you have this monstrous back end. And so this next evolution is 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 really just that. What we realize is, look, we need to do a platform upgrade. Because if we're going to do this thing and we're going to leverage the Masternode network to get usernames on the thing, well, there's so much that you just kind of get for free that we might as well just do these other things so that we have this whole kind of base layer of data exchange and information. So we threw in this thing that we're calling Dash Drive. And we're going to be leveraging a, a common um, a decentralized uh, database system called uh, Orbits, I think. Uh, it is IPFS, but there's a certain kind of database that uses IPFS that we're looking at, that, pick that starts with an O. Um, it, for, we were in, and then we were out, and then we were in, but we ended up, so this is one of the interesting things, right? We ended up working with, I, I feel like it's orbits. I, that, that may not be right. That's not right. Anyway, there's this database that's built on top of IPFS, and that organization is a decentralized database organization. We've been working with them, right, because we're we ended up trying to solve some of the same problems of distributing and propagating information across this network in a, in a, in a speedy way. And through the partnership that we were able to fund with our Arizona State U, they were able to find some research, op or through their research, find some options for us to propagate this data through the Masternode network, end-to-end -end encrypted, optionally, you can opt in, encrypted or not, and then have it land on this, on this uh, uh, second layer that is the dash drive, where you can now store data massive amounts of data, but that data is going to be for a fee. It's not going to be for free, and the master nodes will get paid for that. So now we have data storage, end-to-end -end encrypted transmissions, and a payments network where you can own your name, right? We're creating new real estate, in my opinion. Your name will be real estate, and it's not free to register. And so we're creating this whole new market. Of, of ways to exchange value and information across a network just with a name. And that name will be transferable. That name will be whatever you choose it to be, perhaps or perhaps not. We might randomize some suffixes to keep, it, to keep ourselves out of the trademark and copyright game. So that, that's, so that's something that we have to acknowledge, right? So we are an organization that, that cares about the world we live in. We have to acknowledge that there are legal systems, there are rules, there are certain trademark protections, and if we're creating a system where names are fun fundamental to the system, well, Coca-Cola is going to want their name, you know, if we're going to be that network. And, you know, all these other organizations who have, who have the existing trademarks, they're going to want that protected, and we're going to need ways to deal with that. Well, guess what? We're designing ways to deal with that. Um, again, leveraging the Masternode network in ways that provides both for the pr privacy of individuals, but for the transferability of, of these names. And, you know, that just sets us up for a market, an exchange market. But we've also got in our designs ways to register applications. So any developer in the world is going to be able to use their username to register applications, just like the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. And with that, you're going to be able to basically say configure how you want your application to function and uh, the rules of how your application behaves. And those rules will be stored on the dash drive in this little thing we call the schema, the dash schema. And this is going to be our answer for smart contracts. And uh, it, we call them data contracts. That's what it is right now. Because on the, by comparison, on the Ethereum network, you pay for processing. You pay for things to be processed in a certain way. On the Dash network, you pay for the mining power or the, the transmission of value. You don't you, nothing gets necessarily processed. Um, it's, it's, uh, so what that means is you will be able to write code in whatever language that you're comfortable with, whether that's Python or Node or Java. And you'll be able to do your processing on whatever systems that you're comfortable with, your centralized systems or your decentralized systems. You can integrate that however you want. And then you'll be able to take the results of that processing and store it and have it validated by both the miners and the staked master nodes and know that that data that you stored and encrypted optionally has been hashed and, and, and ha now has an archival record on the blockchain. So you have both the storage and the results of that storage hashed in the network, proof, auditability, traceability, to the degree that you have chosen. And with that, 
With those data contracts, now you've got information for the basics of our economy. You can store profile information, you can store shipping information, you can store credit information if you so choose. We're not the ones who are going to say who, what can and cannot be there. We're going to provide a platform for those businesses out there who want to migrate away from the old fiat systems and into our system so that they can do things like payroll and coffee <laughs> and you know all of the supply chain parts that need to where there's value exchanges all along the way collapsing the intermediaries along the way and providing a decentralized global solution for all of this information where everything is under the control of the end users whether they be developers or payers you know um, that's the most exciting thing to me we are solving extremely large problems and providing a platform to do it but the, when you do these kinds of things you have to move slow you have to move incrementally and so a lot of people get afraid just like we did just like every single developer was afraid of god I don't want everybody seeing how much money I make you know I don't want everybody to know where how, what I'm getting paid not a problem your username is separate. You register that separate. Your username controls multiple wallets optionally. You control whether or not you have access. Shoot, we've even talked with Darren Tapp, uh, one of our researchers, a mathematician at, uh, in, on the East Coast, who basically said, look, we can use these mathematical uh, like bloom filters and, and, and various other pieces of technology. We can use that to like hide addresses. Like you can have hidden, whole hidden accounts underneath. Like you can have a, a username with a hundred accounts and you'll be able to switch on and switch off whether or not these different accounts are, are visible even within your wallet. So, and, and you know, I mean, you can do this kind of thing. I don't know if you guys know about the $5 wrench attack uh, with, with hardware wallets. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's just so many. So <laughs> when, when you get a hardware wallet, um, you know, you, you, you store your information on the hardware wallet. The nice thing about these things is you, if the, so, okay, so the $5 wrench attack. Um, you've got a hardware wallet, you've got all kinds of money on it. Uh, somebody can come to you with a $5 wrench and beat you over the head and say, give me your password, right? Your life can be threatened to get your password. Maybe the other order. Say again? They you and then hit you. Over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would threaten you first, usually. <laughs> and, then, and then hit you for your troubles. <laughs> right. Um, but so, so one of the mechanisms to prevent against that is to set up your hard wa hardware wallet in such a way where you have basically throwaway funds on, on a fake account. And, and that's, that's the password that you give should you be attacked. Now, a smart attacker might know this and say, no, give me the real password. And maybe you set up three or four, you know? <laughs> Um, or maybe you set up one. You say, I'm, I'm serious. This is all I got. I'm poor. Right, right. And, you know, it's, it's, it, at that point, you know, gosh, hopefully nobody, nobody ever gets in that situation. But at least you've done your measure um, uh, with that $5 wrench attack. Well, it, so with this, you can give them, you can do the same kind of thing. You can set up multiple passwords, but even then you can have things hidden underneath. Then that's not going to be MVP. That's not going to be in the first release because we don't know necessarily how that interface should be, should be managed. But those possibilities exist. With this platform, those kinds of possibilities exist. I mean, we're going to be able to integrate with every single economic activity, uh, streaming media with Netflix, you know, pay, uh, logging in. This is one of the, I think this is one of the um, most interesting things. You'll be able to authenticate just like you can use Google or Facebook. You'll be able to use Dash to authenticate on the network. And the nice thing about that is Dash has a policy of not collecting any personal information. So you know that when you're authenticating to a network, you're using a globally backed, mined, both hybrid, stake, proof of stake, and proof of work system that is backing your login, your single login with this, with this click, right? But no personal information is being exchanged. Nothing is being given out about you. And I think that's going to be really attractive, especially in this age of privacy. And this is the thing that I think is going to progress us into the future. Being a quote unquote privacy coin is not something that we necessarily want to advocate. Uh, well, not, not advocate, but we don't, we don't, we don't, that's not our ethos. It's about bringing freedom to individuals. And if you want to bring freedom to individuals, you have to respect their individual rights, their liberties, their privacy. So that's just a fundamental thing. It's just kind of a given that you have to do that as long as you're going to offer freedom. So maintaining that freedom is really a powerful thing. Um, 
So we don't have a whole lot of time. I, uh, gosh, geez, ranting. Seven, we have seven minutes left. Do you believe that? Yeah. Um, so just want to do a Q and A or something. Or? Yeah, yeah. Let's. I want to. Oh, I wanted to leave a little time for Q and A. So um, if you guys have questions for any of us, uh, raise your hand. Throw it up. I saw Jeff's hand come up. Okay, so the question was how, how do we deal with the how do how do we live through the the, the, the fast rise and, and fall of, of crypto uh, as we were getting paid in it? Um, and I'll be very brief, but but I I I used to trade on the foreign exchange. I used to, back in my twenties when I uh, and so I was I've done some technical analysis personally, and so I've through <laughs> since I got into crypto, which is late twenty fifteen, um, I I continued to do crypt, uh, technical analysis on the charts, and and I got I personally built a habit of Cashing into fiat on rises up and hodling on the on 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 dips. Yeah, so, it's easy to say. I know, I know, I know, and it's it's not hard, but you have to do it on a monthly basis. So basically, there's a simple practice for me that I've developed is get my bills paid immediately. Like I just cash out a certain amount to cover my bills for the month because I get paid monthly, and then the rest um, I'm watching the charts and I'm selling on the highs and I'm and I'm trying to hodl on the lows yeah, and buy back. You know because so you with Fibonacci analysis and technical analysis, you can compare ranges and movements, and there are some some points. Let's say 20% of the time, it's obvious this is a high, this is a low. 80% of the time, you really don't know. You really don't know, and that's and so I just bank on the 20% where I'm going to get lucky, and the 80% where I just do basic you management. Me that psychology does nothing. You think. This doesn't affect you psychologically to see to see you fall <laughs> off. Cliff? Yeah, so it's all about risk management, and this is a very, very uh, scary concept to people in the statist world, because the, the state tries to promise safety to everyone. Everything's uniform and safety. Everyone's equal. Everything's provided. Everything's free, free healthcare, free everything. The real world, I would say, the entrepreneurial world, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. If you start a business, hey, I'm going to get a, some investment, get a business together, and then you might have a bad month, low customers, and you might have a great month, a lot of them. There's a lot of up and down, just like the crypto markets, if you're working for yourself. And so you have to get good at risk management. You have to get good at living lean for the, the dips, and then managing and su successfully being responsible with the times of plenty, right? You have like a great month at your business, and then you save and invest and do stuff like that. And then when you have like a lean month, you're, you're covered. You don't just like live like a rich month and then you get a poor month and you're just cleaned out. Yeah. So the same thing works with the market things. Everything, life is an up and down and up and down. Like how do you, how do you store for, like my parents are cattle ranchers, right? And sometimes you have droughts. How do you prepare for that? How do you do that kind of thing? This is the law of the universe. Crypto works like the law of the universe. So once you get, out of that terror mindset of like, oh, things are different. What am I going to do? I'm closing up. Yeah. Once you get out of that mindset and just embrace the the uh, rise and swell of the waves of freedom, of the natural that's, rhythm of the world, it becomes less crazy. It's fascinating to think that, that crypto is given to average people an insight into what life has always been like. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a really fascinating way to look at it. Well, yeah, and I want to comment on that. Like uncertainty, that's one of the things that I've noticed is extremely fearful for most people. Most people are not comfortable with uncertainty. I've had people asking for intermediaries on the Dash network. I want a guarantee. I want insurance. I want this stuff. Well, you can set that up, sir. If you want to provide an insurance policy for people, you can be an intermediary if you should, cho should so choose. But Dash is not going to do that. We're not interested. We are going to live in this uncertain world, and we're going to try yeah, to I, figure I, out this uncertainty. I, I have to go introduce the Butler, but thank you for that. I, yeah. I, I appreciate your insight very much. Right. I've got my next well, last question, yeah. then. Yeah. Quick question. So once evolution is in, what's left 
to scale to, say, uh, visa type transaction uh, levels and then beyond that to microtransaction yeah, kind so of things kind of. We're going to have a lot of options. Um, with the Dash schema, Dash Drive, and a lot of other, there's going to be a, a, additional options that are, going, that are going to open up. We're going to be able to create a layer three network on top of our master node layer two network on top of our blockchain layer one network. So you get this bifur this this hugely distributed third layer of client applications that are running whatever they want to run to do whatever they want to do, and they can kick off side chains or do whatever they want on other blockchains, and then write their resulting data back to that layer two of the master node network. So. Uh, we're trying to enable the merchant developers of the world to do all of that. We're not going to do scale. all of that to, yeah. to scale. Yep. Yeah. We're just creating this platform for everybody to just, we're just, it's just green field. Here's a bunch of dirt, go plant some seeds, let's yeah. see what happens. And how close are you, here we go, before, you, before they do that, right? right so timing is always that. hard, but we're, we're breaking it down by milestones. And, and the I mean, milestones. How close to that level of transactions once evolution comes up? It's, it's hard to calculate um, because we don't know exactly what's going to come out. That uncertainty is, is, is embedded in what we're doing. So it's, it's difficult to predict. Are we good? So, Sorry, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. For